And now it's time for the sponsor perspective portion of our program. Before we get going, a quick clarification. While I'm conducting the interview and all of these questions are really mine, the content of this portion of this event shouldn't be considered editorial. With that, I'd like to thank, I'd like to welcome and thank Brian Hendricks, Vice President of Policy and Government Relations at Nokia. Brian, great to see you. You've heard a little bit about the discussion today, and I gave you credit along with Michael Lewis, David Rohde, for sort of inspiring this question of what do we do at a time? What is the way in which we lift up the country out of a winner versus loser, zero-sum game, partisan side, to begin looking at, you know, really nonpartisan expertise in government. Um, and I know that this is a priority for you. We'll get into telecom, but I'd like to hear you just talk for a minute about how you in the private sector, with a lot of familiarity with government, look at how deeply uh, we have apparently cut into expertise across the board in government. Well, sure. Thank you, uh, Steve. For it's great to see you again. Uh, it is a major problem, uh, as you and I have talked about, for a couple of reasons. I, I'm, I'm a former government servant myself. I was an enforcement lawyer at the, the Federal Communications Commission and a staff director of a of an important Senate committee. The expertise of the federal workforce is incredibly important in informing the decisions that are made by every level of our government. Experts. Uh, from agencies are often sent on details to congressional committees because they have expertise in programs and in, in implementation activities. Uh, and so so government relies for its its function, for its its ability to deliver on the, the myriad promises and programs uh, that are implemented. Think about right now, we're going to have a new president coming in who has already announced a number of programs and projects related to closing the digital divide. Uh, that's gonna involve authorizing new programs, appropriating money. You need expertise at agencies like Department of Commerce, people who have had experience interpreting, writing rules, setting up a program to, to distribute the funding, to provide key oversight to make sure that the money isn't wasted. A lot of that expertise has been disappearing uh, across agencies. So it's not just in my, my little corner of the world for telecom, it's in every sector, we're losing expertise, people who have heritage and experience, um, who can advise other government agencies, who can advise Congress, that expertise is just disappearing. Well, you are um, at it, you know, on Twitter, you know, now and then I love, I love reading your tweets where you've been uh, frustrated by the funding cycles. And I just raised this with Diane Ronaldo and Gigi Sohn, about the funding cycles, the infrastructure that goes in, and that, that you know, let's just be honest and be very candid. We've been talking for decades about, you know, connecting various parts of the country. We had a kind of a top-down approach, and that these funding commitments, we've just had, you know, some funding come in, but you, you argue, you know, it's gonna take 12 months to get to the other end of that. And I don't wanna lose our audience in the kind of, you know, the deal, the sausage making of this, but what do we have to get right in terms of, if, if we were to put Brian Hendricks in charge and say, we're gonna find, do it differently to, to uh, uh, connect people, you know, and solve this broadband connectivity issue, but do it in a way where that policy expertise is coming back, where whatever is getting in the way gets out of the way. I'd love to hear what the answer is, if there is one. I don't know if it's the answer, but certainly part of the answer is again drawing from the expertise that you have and the experience that you have. We've been, sadly, we've been struggling with the question of the digital divide in this country through multiple generations of technology, indeed, all the way back to the foundation of the Bell system, um, trying to connect the last bit of the population. And uh, really, we're in the midst of the pandemic. We're learning all sorts of new things, um, not great things, by the way, things like uh, we haven't covered as many people as we thought we had covered, or there are more limitations on adoption. So um, the first thing you have to do is, is have a technology agnostic approach. All technologies need to be available to solve the problem. That means we don't show fealty to the way we've done it in the past or only a fiber to every house or only a wireless connection. We need to make sure we don't disqualify technologies, that we have smart people who can assess which technologies make the most sense in, in different places. And we have to take a look at our distribution programs, how we send the money out, how we qualify people to receive it, um, how we provide oversight to make sure that the money is spent the way it needs to be spent, and that we're not overbuilding places that have already been built because we don't have the kind of funds to basically do this two and three times. 
Um, so you need that expertise that I'm talking about, but I think it starts by recognizing we have to learn from the mistakes we've made in the past. We've spent 50, 70, 100, depends on your number and how far back you go, billion dollars trying to connect the unconnected and the underserved. And the truth is we've gotten fairly marginal returns for that investment. And I think everything has to be on the table. No fealty to things just because we've done them in the past. But at the same time, you do have to have people who have experience administering these programs before you just start shooting taxpayer money out into the ether. And sadly, the Department of Commerce is, is one of the departments that has been most devastated. It's also probably the front end of any broadband distribution program that's going to come from Congress and in the new year uh, with the Biden administration is going to involve heavy in, uh, influence from the Commerce Department, which has just been devastated by this administration. Do you think, I mean, what I'm, I'm hearing from you is a train wreck that, that you know, there's going to be a lot of expectation, a lot of resources thrown at, a lot of demands, uh, and that you don't have the people to execute. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, I'm certainly concerned about that. I have no doubt we'll figure out a way to spend the money. I'm just not sure at the end of the, the line we're going to be real happy with the result. Um, that's not by way of me saying I don't think that broadband is a priority, as an example. It means that you have to be attentive to to the challenges and the limits that you've had, and you're going to need to, to, to marshal more expertise. Um, you're going to need to be able to take time. You're going to need to be prescriptive in the legislation to make sure. I mean, honestly, one of the last times we did a, a broadband uh, stimulus program under uh, Barack Obama, we actually forgot. I was in Congress at the time. We actually forgot to create an oversight office to actually exist all the way through the life cycle of the project to make sure that they got built and they got spent. So Congress may have to actually spend a little bit more time uh, you know, detailing exactly what it wants to do and creating some structures in the legislation itself to make sure that we actually spend the money and solve the problem. Um, because there are, there's a dearth of experts with experience in implementing programs of that size right now. You know, one of the things I've been tooling around in my head with, you know, in anticipation of today in journalism, in high quality journalism, there are a couple of, you know, motifs that are, that are important, which is, you know, it's supposed to be objectively distant journalism uh, and, and news without fear or favor. I mean, there's a kind of question that, that when you talk about, uh, as, as I think Diane Rinaldo was speaking about, about, about uh, employees in government that, that are there uh, without, you know, they're, they're nonpartisan, they're there for the public good, that's what their North Star is. And it's just given this filter where politics and political persuasion seems to be uh, coming into these spaces. We've seen the so-called deep state attacks, et cetera, uh, undermining, you know, the question of whistleblower statutes and whatnot. And I don't know if I were Joe Biden and his team, how do you create a trust zone, you know, where you're not doing exactly the same thing, where you're not bringing people in that just automatically align with Joe Biden's policy DNA. Uh, and, and in a way, even if it's inadvertent, repeating the problem. I'd just be interested as a guy who's been around this world, do you have any Guide, guidance on how you get back into kind of bringing people in with an objectively distant public service oriented mandate that they feel that that's their cause and why they're, they're there. Yeah, so I think um, the congressman who was on just before me started talking about, you know, a, a creating a sense of purpose among people and, and a shared sense of purpose. And you're not wrong that the, the dialogue on both sides has gotten to a point where government officials are being harassed for simply doing their jobs, whether you're talking about election officials, whether you're talking about, um, you know, uh, commissioners of, a, of an agency implementing a policy decision that's unpopular with one sector of the population or not. You've got this over um, uh, this umbrella of language around because language matters, you know, so talking about the swamp and talking about people uh, in government as deep state that has created that's driven people out of government moving people into agencies as political appointees for the purpose of, of uh, surveilling activities and loyalty tests and things of this nature it caused a lot of people to walk away. So you've got that problem. It caused a lot of people who've stayed in government to just kind of put their heads down, or aren't willing to speak out and voice their expertise for fear of retribution. So you've got that problem that has to be overcome. And then the third problem is the one you're speaking to, which is 
for that next generation of worker who finds lots of opportunities to do other things. Uh, where does the call to public service come from? I think we're going to need to to redouble our efforts in a number of respects. Uh, agencies are going to need to have support from Congress for funding to maintain and even expand some of the hiring programs like the honors attorney program or uh, things like the, the presidential management fellowship programs to get young, smart people uh, back into government, to, to seeing it as a reward, to, pr to promoting data-driven rather than belief-based policymaking. Uh, so it's going to require uh, funding. It's going to require certainly people to dial down the rhetoric and stop attacking the federal workforce. Because I can tell you, as a guy who who had responsibility not just for for writing the laws that that created some of these programs, but to provide oversight. You can't do that as, as a member of Congress and staff if you don't have professionals in the agencies with the expertise to implement the programs. And again, that's being significantly uh, deteriorated as we speak. And I think my point in, in even wanting to raise this program was to say that regardless of how bold uh, you know, President-elect Biden's agenda ultimately is, he needs those people. There will be executive orders that will be repealed that have to be implemented. Rules will have to be changed. There will be new executive orders that have to be interpreted and implemented through rulemakings. There will be new programs authorized. There will be new appropriations. All of those grand ambitions, a big infrastructure bill. Good luck with all of that if you can't count on the workforce and the expertise to both inform how those programs are structured, but also to actually deliver on the promise on the back end. We, there's a real threat here that uh, you know, the president-elect's administration is going to be stymied by what's happened to the workforce. I hope not. I think we all have work to do to rebuild confidence in government service. Brian, just in conclusion, um, you know, most of the, uh, I mean, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. Most of the great policy experts I know, and I have been privileged to talk to people in all fields, but the really best people are kind of like you. They're obsessive compulsive about their issue. They can't stop doing it or talking about it. And one of the things I've been interested is where have these people gone that have left the federal workforce? And I'm just wondering, have they gone to work for their states? Have they gone to the local community? I know that Nokia is working at all levels. I know we're talking federal workforce today, but is there a talent pool that we are making a mistake about uh, ignoring, ignoring that is not necessarily at the federal level, but there may be some great um, deposits of expertise at the state and local level that could come in and help steady the ship? Well, I think you're you're on to something there. I think that we the people who've left government, right? A lot of them, folks that I've I've dealt with for many years, were not folks who were were close to retirement. They had lots of of years of service left, and those folks could potentially be enticed to come back into government service, not on a partisan basis, but just by the climate uh, having gotten better and less combative. Uh, they're passionate, as you note, know, about policy programs. And in, in my case, it's telecom and technology, but there are people who are passionate about energy and uh, agriculture and all sorts of things. So some of those people will come back, provided the funding is there to, to bring them back into service. Um, but but I also think that it's just going to take time for some of the workforce that's left to, to feel good about reasserting their expertise. And then the, the recruiting part of new people into government, I, I mentioned you know, a couple of tools like the, the management fellowship programs, the honors attorneys. There can be other ways that we appeal to um, state and, and people with state and local expertise who have interest in moving into federal government work um, uh, or going into state work in partnership with the states. Because at, at, at a certain level, you have the same kinds of issues at, at, at the state level where, where the agencies require expertise and program implementation. You know, it should be pretty common sense to most people that if you don't have people who are good at implementing programs, you're probably not going to be happy with the programs that the government is implementing. So part of the public's trust in government is that government needs to be better at what government does. And that does, you know, rely in, in some big measure on the quality of the people who are implementing the programs. Well, so Brian, kind of I'm, uh, Brian Hendricks, Vice President of Policy and Government Affairs for Nokia. I'm always really happy they hired you because I love talking to wonky think tank types. And I'm glad that you're employed well at a company because you're a wonky think tank type. Uh, but thank you so much, Brian, for helping to support Thanks, today's program and for your own thoughts. Thanks very much. Thank you.